to lesson four of the virtual two minute beach school all about the tides and rock pools today. How have you been since our last lesson? We've had a half term here so we've had a nice little rest but of course I've still been doing my beach cleaning. What about you guys? Has anyone had a chance to go out and do a beach clean or a street clean or even a, maybe a litter pick? Perhaps you've spoken to your friends and family and got them to come along with you. We've loved seeing your work from last week and really enjoyed hearing about your wraps as well. Keep on sending them in. And what about the poster competition? It's not too late to enter if you haven't already. Because the virtual beach school is carrying on for a few more weeks, the deadline is now the 19th of March. So get your applications in. So today we're going to be looking a little bit about tides. We're going to be playing a tide game. We're going to be looking at rock pool life and we're going to be doing a rock pool experiment. So we've got four new words to look out for today. Tide, gravity, habitat, and adapt. Now Helen's writing them on the sand for you there. If you would like to, on the website, there is a look, say, cover, write sheet that can help you out if you want it. So if you've got a sandpit or a sand tray at home or at school, why not try writing the words? It's really great fun. You could use a paper and pen for this bit. We're going to be making a list. Or, if you've got someone there with you at the moment, you could be having a discussion. Are you ready? I'm going to ask you a question, and then I'm going to give you a few moments to think about your answer. The question. Why is it important to know about the tides and their times when you go to the beach? So, reasons to check the times. Well, I like to swim and sometimes you can't swim if there's not enough water, so that's a good one. Um, and then other times I suppose I just want to sit and have a picnic and if I want to just sit then it's quite important that there's sand to sit in. Why else might I want to check the tides? Um, I guess to make sure that it's safe and not going to be too dangerous with big waves coming over. Um, I think that is your time's up. How many did you get? So let's compare your lists at home with ours here. We've got so many I can't remember them all so I'm actually going to read them out. When there's most sand, where to eat lunch, where to play, if there's lots of rocks, finding the rock pools, if I can walk, when to surf, if I'll get my feet wet, when to swim, can I paddle, will it be safe, will the waves come over the wall? Will it be busy? Did you get these? Or did you get more of your own too? So we know why it's important to know the tide times. Now we need to know how tides work. So thinking about the tides, tides is one of our words for today. And it literally means the rise and fall of the sea. If we see here where I am now, it would be low tide because there isn't a lot of water up on the beach. And then, if we were up on the strand line, remember strand line from a previous lesson and where that is, if we were up there, that would be more uh, water on the beach. There we go, there's Claire up on the strand line. But what makes the water move, Helen? So, time for a little experiment. I'm going to ask you to stand up, have a think about all the things that you've got around and the space around you, because in a moment I'm going to ask you to copy Claire. OK, are you ready? So what I want you to do is I want you to jump. Just once. You don't have to go very high. Have a think. What happened when you jumped? I'm going to ask you to do it again. Really think. Are you ready? Jump. Did you step in the air? Or did you come down? Yes, that's right. You came down. And the thing that brings you down is called gravity. That's one of our words for today. Gravity is invisible, but it pulls all things back down. Isn't that fantastic? And gravity is really important for understanding how tides work. So I want you to imagine that this rock here is the Earth. This rock here is the Moon. The Earth is constantly turning. And the moon here uses a really strong pull of gravity. And as the earth moves around in this whole day, when it's 
facing the moon here, that gravity makes a nice high tide. When the Earth moves round here, it's away from the moon, so you get the low tide. It moves again, and you get another high tide over here, and then here, and you get another low tide. Right, so now we're going to play a little game to help us remember this. You will need two objects. It doesn't matter what shape or size. Or you could use two people. One will be the Earth, one will be the Moon. Move the Earth slowly in a circle. Move the Moon slowly around. Point which side of the Earth will have the high tide and which will have the low tide. If you need help, have a look here at what Claire is doing. Got it? Brilliant. So it's the Sun and the Moon together that control how big the tide is, how high the high is and how low the low is. But I think we're going to leave that science for another day. Before we move on, it's really important that we understand the time between each tide. We're going to work that out together. How many hours are there in a day? Yep, there's 24, so you're going to need 24 things. Helen is collecting 24 pebbles and each pebble is going to be one hour. So, how many low tides are there per day? Can you remember? Yeah, it's two, so Helen is going to draw two circles in the sand. And then how many high tides are there per day? Yep, you're right, it's two again, so we're going to draw two more circles for the high tides in the sand. Helen's now dividing her hours, which are the pebbles, equally between the circles which show the tides. Can you do the same at home? And then the number of pebbles, remember they are the hours, that will end up in each circle will be the number of hours between each tide. So how many pebbles have we got in there? You can see she's got six. She's got six pebbles in each circle. So that means there's six hours for each tide. That's going to be a super useful fact if you can remember that one. How did you get on at home with your counting and dividing of pebbles? So we're going to do a really fun activity now, which you can try when you come to the beach too. Though it's also really important that you check the tide times before you come with an adult. So you can see that Claire's got loads of rocks here in her hand. She's going to pop them down in a line. You can see how the waves are just perhaps starting to come up to the rocks. If, throughout the lesson, the waves come over the rocks, that would mean that the tide is coming in. If the tide doesn't reach them, that means that the tide's going out. Let's just see what happens to these throughout our lesson. We will pop back and have a look. And as you can see now, the tide's just coming up over the stones as she's popping them down. We've now had an opportunity to learn a little bit about the tides. Next, we need to think about why that's important and about our impact upon the tides. That's another really cool fact there, Helen. How do we have an impact on the tides? We can't change the moon or the earth, but some of the things that we do can influence what happens to the tides. Right, time for an activity. And this is something that you might want to try later. What we're going to do here is we're actually going to see if we can change the flow of this water. Claire's got a really big pile of stones. And off she goes now. She's going to try and build a dam to see if we can change the direction of the water. And you see how she's getting those really big stones? And let's see what's happening. The water's slowing down a little bit and it's going in and out of the stones that she's building there. And she's got a few more to go. And we can start to see that the water's beginning to just pool a bit more around here. And we're going to see if we can change its direction just over here. You can try this if you want. 
and change the direction of the water when you next come to the beach. So by building dams and water defences and other buildings, you can see the effect on the flow of the water and that directly links to the tides. It might mean that some places have a different high tide and other places get a lower tide. Now this is something you can try doing at home. You can collect some pebbles from your garden, use a tray from your kitchen, go build yourselves a dam. So we've learnt a little bit how things that we build can influence our environment. What about those things that we use? Hmm, let's think back to our previous lessons. Have you got a pen and paper? We're now going to make a little list about all those things that we use that could have an impact upon our environment. So, things that impact the environment that we use, well, we learned all about plastic, didn't we, last week? We know that that's bad for the environment when we throw it away. Um, and cars, now they're quite bad to use, and aeroplanes, so we'll put them together, cars, cars and planes. Um, what else might be bad? Well, I suppose the reason that cars and planes are bad is for the fuel, so we'll put fuel in there as well. Now, electricity can also be sometimes bad, can't it? We'll put electric there. And I think we're out of time. How many did you get? So you can see that there's lots of things that we use that have an impact upon our environment. We burn fuels, we use things, it makes the earth hotter and the sea levels rise. So next, we're going to find out some of the impacts that tides have on rock pools. Amazing, so here we are amongst the rock pools of our classroom. Now rock pools are one of the most interesting habitats we have on our coastal sections of the UK and the creatures and the plants that live here are some of the most interesting we find on our rocky shores. Now I just used one of our new words, did you spot that? We'll come back to that in just a second. So what happens is when the tide comes up this area is all covered in water but can you remember what happens when the tide goes back again? That's right, it will drop down and all of these little holes and trenches will get filled up with water and become these awesome little rock pools. Make sense, Helen? Yeah, absolutely. And it's another reason why we need to check the tides before we come to the beach. If the rock pools are only there at low tide, then we would only need to come to the beach to look in them at low tide. Yeah, absolutely really important. So, should we go and have a little explore? Because all of these areas are different at different stages of the tide. So here I am in the splash zone. Now the strand line is about here. So this is where the highest point of the tide comes. And that means it's the splash zone. So it gets splashed by waves, but it will never be fully underwater. So a few steps further down and we're here on the upper shore. Now, as we said earlier, there are some days where the tide doesn't come up this far, so the water doesn't even change. Now, this area is the middle shore, and this is where we find most of our rock pools. It's also where most of the plants and animals live. And finally, we have the lower shore. Now, this area is almost always covered in water, but twice a month, on a day like today, it might be dry for a couple of hours. Excellent, Claire. So I've been drawing myself a little diagram while you've been talking here. Um, I think I've got it all. Let's have a little look. So, I've got my sea here, and then I've got the beach huts on land. I've got the splash zone, and that only just gets the splashes of the sea and then the tide goes out a little bit and you get the upper shore then the tide goes out a little bit more and you get the middle shore and that's where we get the most of our rock pools then we get the lower shore did i get it all claire yeah good one helen right guys i'm going to give you 30 seconds at home to write down or have a think about one thing that you've learned so far i'm going to go off and find us some rock pools off you go
we mentioned earlier that rock pools are a habitat that we have here on our rocky shores. But what is a habitat? Well, I know that a lion's habitat is the deserts of Africa. I know that a shark's habitat is the ocean. And I know that a hedgehog's habitat is my garden. But what does all that mean? Well, that's where they all live, isn't it? Exactly right, Helen. It's where they all live. So a habitat is somewhere that an animal or a plant lives. And a rock pool is a habitat that we have here on our rocky shores. Now, before I tell you about all of the bizarre and interesting creatures that we have living in our rock pools, I'd like you to have a think about some that you might know already. Perhaps you've been to the beach before and done some rock pooling. Maybe you've seen some of the critters. Maybe you've just seen a TV show about it. I'm going to give you two minutes to write a list, draw a picture, have a little think about any of the creatures that you think that might live in a rock pool. Off you go. How did you get on? Don't worry if you didn't get it all, we'll be coming back to it in a little while. So next, we're going to look at why a rock pool habitat might be tricky to live in. There's three reasons and we're going to look at the first reason now. Time for a little experiment to help. Now you can do this along with me if you want during your lesson or you can have a go afterwards. So all you're going to need is a plastic bottle, a jug of water and a pen. Now you might also need a pen and paper to take some notes, but luckily for me, I've got Helen doing that in the classroom. So, you can see my beautiful bottle here. I have decorated it with the lower shore, middle shore, upper shore, and the splash zone. And I've even drawn some little fishes and seaweeds to help to show it better. And what we're gonna do is, this jug of water here is gonna be the sea. Now, we know that the tide takes six hours, don't we? So what we're gonna do is show the sea being added to the shore for six hours. And let's see what happens to our different zones. So, hour number one, the water comes to about there. What are we doing? Oh, we're just about touching the lower shore there, aren't we? Right, hour number two, how are we doing? Oh, we're nearly at the middle shore, so there's a little bit more covered up all the time, but the lower shore is still covered, of course. Hour number three, where are we? Oh yep, yeah, we're nearly at the middle now, aren't we? So the middle shore is starting to get covered up too. But of course the lower shore is still covered. Hour number four. Now the middle shore is really well covered now. We're almost up to the upper shore. So the upper shore is starting to get a little bit wet. Hour number five. And we are not moving much at this point and we're getting really close to the strand line. And then the last hour of the tide is hour number six. And that's about the high tide line, isn't it? So if we have a look at our bottle here now, what's going on with all the water up here? You can see that the splash zone has been really well splashed, but it's actually still not underwater, is it? So all of the creatures living up here 
are just getting a little bit splashed. Now, right then, let's have a look at our results. Helen, what have we got? So I've got here that the lower shore was covered for six times, so that's six hours. I've got that the middle shore was covered four and a half times. That's there. I've got that the upper shore was covered three times. And the splash, just a few little splashes, so a half there as well. So what does that mean for the animals living in our rock pools? It means that some live up here because they really like it dry, and others live down here because they like it to be always wet. So one thing that makes it challenging to live in these rock pools is the water levels. The first one, the amount of water. Is there anything else that makes it a super challenging habitat? The weather! Now, in order to understand why the weather affects the water in our rock pools, it's important to understand what's actually in seawater. Helen, have you ever accidentally tasted seawater? Maybe when you've been swimming at the beach? Yes, I have, Claire. It's really, really disgusting, isn't it? And really salty. Exactly, Helen, it's really salty. So what I've got here is three glasses with water in them. Now I've added no salt to this one, a little bit of salt to this one, and lots of salt to this one. And what's gonna happen is when we put the eggs into the water, the one with all the salt, the egg should float. Let's have a little go. So let's pop it in that one. The egg's going to sink. No salt there. This one. Oh, the egg's kind of going up and down a little bit. It's not sure whether it wants to sink or wants to float. So it's obviously just got a little bit of salt there. And then this one here, going to float. Loads of salt in there. Now, what's this got to do with rock pool critters? Obviously, we wouldn't want to have a bath in salty water. That sounds gross. But the rock pool animals love that salt. Now, there are two things to do with our weather that affect the level of salt in our pools. Can you think of them? I reckon I know one of them. Is it the sun? Yes, Helen, exactly, the sun. Now, you may have heard the word evaporation. Evaporation is what happens when something hot, like the sun, heats up a liquid and that liquid disappears, leaving behind whatever else is in it. OK, so here's a little test I did at home. Have a look at the screen there. I filled up a cup with water and put it in a really, really hot place in my house and marked the level of water. Now, I went and checked it every day. And as you can see, the level went down every single day. And after five days, there was a really big difference. Now, that did take five days, but that's because my house is nowhere near as hot as the sun. So when the rock pools have the sun on top of them, this happens really fast. So those rock pools that are exposed to the sun a lot of the day evaporate really quickly. What do you think happens to the taste of that water once the water has disappeared and left the salt behind? Yep, you got it, it tastes even saltier. So the animals living in these homes have to be happy with it being even saltier sometimes. Exactly. Now, I said there were two things to do with the weather that can affect our little rock pools here. Can you think what the other one might be? Um, rain. Yes, Helen, rain, exactly. So. Rain is essentially just water that falls from the sky, right? So what do you think might happen to the level of salt in one of our pools if it fills up with water? Let's have a little practice with our egg, shall we? So we know the egg is floating because there's loads of salt in there. But if rain comes along from the sky and fills it up a bit more, what's happening to the egg? You're right, it's going to sink. So that shows us that the salt level has really gone down. So the animals also need to cope with the water being less salty than they'd like. So our second one is the saltiness of the water. So the tide changes the amount of water, the weather changes the saltiness of the water. I wonder what the third thing is. Well we've already mentioned this one but it's for a slightly different reason. What else changes when the sun comes out? The temperature. Exactly. We've all had those days where we've been at the beach in our jumpers and jeans and hats, and then the sun comes out, just like today, and we start to get really, really hot, don't we? It's just like maybe the other way around, when you're all tucked up nice and comfy in your bed in the mornings, and someone comes in and rips off that duvet, and you get really cold really quickly and a little bit grumpy. Well, that happens to our rock pool critters all the time. Every time the sun comes out or goes away again at night, they have to deal with those massive temperature changes and not get grumpy about it. So the amount of water, the saltiness of the water, and the temperature of the water all change 
all the time, every day. So the animals and the plants of the rock pools have adapted to their conditions here. Now there's that word again, adapt. What does it mean? Adapt means to change, doesn't it? Yes, exactly, Helen. It means to change. And when we talk about animals or plants adapting, we talk about how their bodies have changed for their habitats. So let's go have a look at the four zones that we have here on our rocky shores and see what changes the animals have made to live there. So what zone am I in here then, guys? Can you remember? Have a look at Helen's diagram if you need to. Yep, I'm in the splash zone. So, Helen, can you remind us what the three challenges are of these rock pool habitats? Yes, the amount of water, the saltiness of the water, and the temperature of the water. Excellent, so let's think about what happens in the splash zone and what changes might occur here. Water, does the water level change much? Well, as you can see, it's almost always dry, isn't it? So yes, sometimes it's really, really dry, but it will get wet sometimes. Saltiness, well, because these little pools are often out in the sun, the water is evaporating all the time, so the salt level changes often. Temperature definitely changes a lot, doesn't it? It's really hot in the day when the sun's out, but at night it's going to get really chilly. So Helen, what kind of critters are we going to find here? Ones that don't need a lot of water, they like the salt, and they're happy to go from hot to cold. Yep, like these lovely seaweeds. These are super happy drying out all day in the sunshine and just having a drink at night time when it gets a bit cooler. Let's go see what's going on in the other zones. So here we are on the upper shore. Now, does the water level change much? Yes, it changes loads. Today there's a little bit of water here. Some days it'll be dry and some days it'll be really, really wet. So would the salt change a lot? Well, when it's exposed like this, it's going to change an awful lot, isn't it? As is the temperature, because the sun is shining on it and warming it up as we speak. So the animals and plants that we're going to find here are ones that are happy with lots of water or not a lot of water, ones that are good with quite a lot of salt, and ones that like it quite hot. So things that we're going to find here are like these guys here. We've got barnacles, periwinkles, some top shells, Barnacles are really cool. When they're exposed to the air like this, they've got these tiny little trapdoors that they close themselves off with. So let me try doing the middle shore. Does the amount of water change much? Yes. Every day it gets flushed with new water twice a day. Saltiness. Does that change? A little bit, but because the water gets changed so often, there isn't a lot of time for the water to evaporate temperature. Yes, it changes loads because it gets heated up every day in the sun and then cold water gets refreshed. So here we're going to find animals that need and want a lot of water, don't like a lot of changes in saltiness and are okay with hot and cold. Yeah, nice one Helen, exactly. Just like crabs and anemones. Now we have got some beautiful anemones in these rock pools. They've all got really lovely long tentacles and some of them stay out all the time catching their food. Other ones, like the strawberry or the beadlet anemone, pull their tentacles in when their rock pool goes dry to protect themselves from predators. So then, down here on the lower shore. Well, the water is always really deep here, so there's not a lot of change there. Salt, well, the water can't really evaporate very well because the water is so deep, so the salt levels don't change very much. Temperature, again, the sun can't really do its job here because there's so much water, so it's always pretty chilly in here. So what we're going to have here is the plants and animals that need lots of water, need the same amount of salt every day, and are quite okay with chilly temperatures all the time. So we're going to get the really delicate plants and animals here. Things like these really lovely delicate seaweeds and some delicate little fish. Now there's a really cool fish that lives here called a blenny, and he's actually got a coating of slime all over him because in case his pool becomes dry one day, he can wriggle his way back into his pool without hurting himself. Wow, that was so much information, Claire. So let's just think. What we're saying is that different animals live in different rock pools and different areas. Is that right? Bang on, Helen. I think it's time for a little activity to help make sure that we remember this, don't you? OK, let's go back to those drawings or the list that you made earlier of all the creatures that you think live in our rock pools. We're going to add to it. 
let's make a little drawing with all of our rock pool zones, starting with the splash zone, going all the way down to the lower shore. And you can add your animals in using some of the things that you've learnt from this session so far. Where are the animals going to go? Is it one that lives in the splash zone or does he live down in the lower shore? There's a worksheet on the website to help you if you need it or just have a go at doing it yourself. We'll be back in two minutes to see how you're getting on. Wow, that went fast. I need another two minutes. Back soon. work guys don't worry if you haven't got it finished there'll be loads of time after the lesson but please do remember to send us your diagrams wow haven't we had a jam-packed lesson it's been so much fun i'm gonna head back to helen for a moment before the tide gets too high and i will see you there in just a second so wow while we wait for claire to come back it started to rain so i popped my coat on to keep myself nice and warm and dry 
let's have a little think about what we've been up to today. And let's think about something called 3, 2, 1. You might have actually done this before. What I want you to think about is three things that you've learned today. Two things that you still want to learn more about. And one question that you still have for us. So it could be something to do with the different tidal zones, or the rock pools, or the habitats where the creatures live. I am back and we are here to revisit the pebbles that we put in the sea a little bit earlier on. Do you remember? We were going to put them right by the edge of the tide and if the pebbles were hidden it means the tide has come up. If the pebbles are still there it means the tide has gone out. Now I don't know if you can see, the tide has come up so far we can't even reach our pebbles. Which means that in the course of this lesson the tide has become higher. And don't forget, send us your posters, we'd love to see them. So we will see you next week for some more virtual Two Minute Beach School. And remember, if you send us your questions, we might be able to answer them. Have a great week. Bye. Bye.